I want to share now our words of wisdom this morning. The first from Proverbs. This is chapter 9, verses 1 through 11. I want you to listen in this for God's word to you in this time and God's word to the church at this time. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her animals. She had mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servant girl. She calls from the highest places in the town. You that are simple, turn in here. To those lacking sense, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of my wine I have mixed. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. And if you would allow, I would add to that. First, let's say, holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. I would add to that just one more poem, a more contemporary word of wisdom. This is another from Denise Levertoff that was shared with me this week and speaks, I think, to the matter that Proverbs tries to get at. It's, I learned her name was Proverb. So here's what Denise has to say. As the secret names of all we meet lead us deeper into our labyrinth of valleys and mountains, twisting valleys and steeper mountains, Their hidden names are always like proverb, promises, rune, omen, fable, parable. Those we meet for only one crucial moment, gaze to gaze, or for years know and don't recognize, but of whom later a word sings back to us as if from high among the leaves, still near but beyond sight drawing us from tree to tree toward the time and the unknown place where we shall know what it is to arrive. So I offer all that holy wisdom to you as well and hope that the Spirit can speak through these words. So I want to share with you that then there has been a reckoning of sorts going on in our house these past weeks something which has required Jason and I to explore some of the darkest parts of life in our home. And by that, of course, I am referring to the most out-of-reach corners of our kitchen cabinets. You see, we've been doing some work on our kitchen. And in order to do that, we've been forced to move most of the things in our kitchen to other sundry locations throughout the house. And I'm not just talking here about the nice upper dishes and mug cabinets, right? I am talking about the big bottom corner cabinets. You know, the ones you kind of got to get down on the ground on your hands and knees to even see in the back of. Do you have any of these cabinets in your house? I'm talking about the dank and dusty cavernous spaces that seem to function like some sort of entrance to Narnia. Except instead of curious British children, the main commuters through these thoroughfares upsettingly but not unsurprisingly seem to be geckos and cockroaches. So we're doing that. And we started by telling ourselves, okay, you know what we're going to do? We're going to be very organized about this. We're going to just box up or bag up the non-essential items, the things we do not need to cook lunch or dinner or make coffee or whatever which we thought would be easy, but it turned out to be a rather profound exercising in confronting what Buddhists might call our attachments. (laughs) Because we started out with the non-essential items, and no, this is not an exaggeration, 25 boxes later, we realized maybe we have a little bit of a problem. So I started to think, okay, okay, that's fine, that's fine. This is a perfect time to pare down some of this stuff. So I started looking around for things we can live without, right? But I couldn't find any, you know? (laughs) I mean, not the cherry pitter. Certainly we need that. Like if we want to make cherries jubilee, what are we going to do? Totally need to hang on to that little machine also that attaches to your counter and you skewer an apple on it and then you turn the handle and it shears off like the peel and most of the apple while it cores. And you have one of those? Well, I know where you can find one. Um, 
I mean, if we decided to make an apple pie, where would we be without that thing? Like in the Stone Age or some vegetable peeler, like late into the night? No, thank you. Now, there was some discussion about the five cake pans, right? And the fact that, yes, we've bought our kids birthday cakes at Safeway the night before, like the whole time they've been alive. But someday, surely, we will arrive at the point where we make them for ourselves, right? And then there's the bunt pan, which I don't even think I've actually ever used. But when you want a bunt, you don't have time to wait for Amazon. You know what I'm saying? There's the pasta-making attachment for the kitchen aid, which led us some wonderful memories about the time of our lives when you actually had time for ridiculous things like making your own pasta. And then there was the falafel maker and the able skeever pan, the croom kaka iron, which reminded us of all of our travels, and we reminisced. There was a little miniature crock pot made for holding like hot dip at parties, which I had actually labeled on the bottom with the piece of tape, last used, October 30th, 2016, throw away. And I could have thrown it away, right? But like then again, where would you find one of those? You know, you're trying to make some hot dip. Then there's the serving ware, right? The dozens of platters and plates and bowls of various shapes and sizes meant for crowds to descend on us, which won't because, well, COVID, but maybe someday they will again. And I have to say, I was like starting to get a little bit down on myself, right? Like, what is all this about? But then I decided to give myself a break. Have you ever tried that? Great practice, giving yourself a break. I just step back and realize that all of these things are really a representation of a deeply held value that both Jason and I share, which is hospitality, right? We love cooking for other people and welcoming them into our home and making them feel warm and full and provided for, and we want as many things as possible at our disposal to do that. And I had that thought, and then I was feeling pretty good. And then I was feeling even better when I read the Proverbs passage was one of the lectionary selections today, a text which is all about Sophia or Lady Wisdom, right? Laying out a feast for those who come to seek her, right? Building a whole house just for the purposes of hosting those that need her insight, right? And inviting everyone to come and dine. Beautiful. I literally thought this. I read that. I thought, that's so beautiful. You know what? I'm 100% sure that wisdom owns a cherry pitter. <laughs> like, I'm in good company this week. And I was just so enthusiastically, like, latched on to that discovery and the comfort that it offered me in my moment of need, coming to terms with my fixation on kitchen gadgets, that I, in planning worship this week, violated my personal policy to never, ever, ever, under any circumstances, try to preach on Proverbs. <laughs> now, why is that, you might ask? Or even if you don't, we're going to go on this journey anyway because I'm in charge up here for this little time. Let's go on a little side journey. Who doesn't love a good proverb? A little statement about common sense, right? I certainly do as much as I love a quality potato masher. Don't want to try to mash potatoes with some crappy thing. Um, the trouble with proverbs is that mostly that's all it is, right? It's just these little kind of pithy statements about things that are or things that we know or should do or feel like we should do. You know, it's a collection of collections of wisdom sayings. It was probably collected over several millennium in a huge geographical area of the ancient Near East, all knit together in one unit, kind of like the intellectual Pinterest of that time. Like, let's just get all the best stuff we can, publish it in a book. It's a lot of general wisdom for living, like, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. That's Proverbs 15.1. How about this? Those who work their land will have food. Those who chase fantasies have no sense. Great advice for an agricultural lifestyle, Proverbs 12, 11. How about this one? I really like this. As dead flies cause a bottle of perfume to stink, so a little foolishness spoils wisdom. I've never actually gotten any dead flies in a bottle of perfume, but I'm willing to accept that, right? Nothing to dispute there. But, you know, in preaching, we're often asking, like, what is the deeper meaning? And sometimes with these sort of, like, short, commonsensical statements, it's, like, difficult to dig deeper than if you scream at somebody, they might get mad, and if you don't, they might not. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's really a challenge, and an additional challenge is that Proverbs really tends to portray a world that is completely black and white. 
there's a right way and there's a wrong way, and that's it. It does not leave a lot of nuance for the curious preacher other than to say, yes, that's true, or no, it isn't. But luckily, between all those statements about everything from how to be a good spouse to how to discipline your children to which various types of alcoholic beverages are helpful for assuaging which particular sorts of despair that is in there, in between all those are these beautiful poems about wisdom and about how wisdom, who is always portrayed as a woman, Sophia is the Greek word for wisdom, how wisdom was there in the beginning. How wisdom was God's friend in all that came to be. That wisdom was encouraging God to laugh and have joy and to play as God brought the world about. And also about how she is here now with us, offering herself freely should we ever need her. And of course, the one I read at the top of this time here is one of those beautiful descriptions, right? It's wisdom saying to those who pass by, come, come and eat my bread and drink my wine. And for me as a preacher, I think this beautiful little scene lets me get away a little bit from the question of what does it mean and draws me instead into a deeper question of what does it feel like? What does it feel like to be in the presence of wisdom? What does it feel like to be beckoned by the Spirit? And the answer seems to be, again and again, in the book of Proverbs and elsewhere where wisdom is discussed, it feels like being welcomed. It feels like your deepest hunger being satiated. It feels like someone who put out the fine china just for you. And the crux of it is that in order to take hold of this wisdom, in order to take hold of this satiation for our hunger and this sense of profound welcome, all we have to do, all we have to do is accept the Spirit's invitation to come and dine. It is as simple as that. All we have to do is be willing to pause, to turn our gaze just for a moment, and to see the feast that has been laid out before us and to come. You know, I got to say, I find that to be so beautiful and so comforting. And I also want to struggle with it like a little bit, you know. It's got me sort of, that's got to be more complicated than that, God's wisdom. It has to be, right? Wisdom is supposed to be hard won, a prize for the diligent, for the one who climbs the top of the mountain to find the sage. You can't just be sitting there on the side of the road ringing a bell saying dinner time, right? That can't possibly be true, but perhaps it can. Perhaps it can be that simple. Perhaps the real challenge to us is to figure out how to make space in our life to hear that invitation how to turn our gaze from our hurried journey and our own priorities and worries and how to hear the Spirit calling us to come and rest and to come and eat and to come and be full. I mean, it's interesting because you see this so clearly in the ministry of Jesus too, right? He's constantly saying, hey, come on. I'll give you the bread of life. Come on. Come sit. I'll give you the living water. You'll never go thirsty. Come. This is my body. Take it. Take it. I don't mind. This is my life. Drink it up. I give it to you freely so that you can live. You know, Jesus, who John tells us is the embodiment of God's wisdom, the Logos made flesh, says more than anything else, take and eat. And I think the question presented ourselves to us is, can we let ourselves accept and let ourselves believe that God offers us all this love? You know, I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking about wisdom, and suddenly I'm back in my kitchen thinking about the falafel maker, thinking, do I need this? And the truth is I don't. To be clear, I'm not going to give it away, just to be clear. I love these little gadgets, but I don't need it to welcome others. That gift is already in my heart. I think it's something God put there. So if it's paper plates and peanut butter sandwiches, I can still show that love. And the rest is just non-essential. You know, I think that gift of hospitality that God has placed in my heart, I think it's a gift that exists in the heart of this church too. 
hospitality. The desire to welcome and the desire to include, the desire to be available to its neighbors, to nourish them, to seek wisdom. And interestingly, I think it's a gift of this church to do that while requiring nothing of its guests other than a desire to receive what has been offered. There, I think, is the most profound gift of this particular church in this particular moment in the history of the world, the place where its deepest wisdom resides. You know, I think it's why I found so much joy and fulfillment in our partnership as pastor and people these past almost seven years is that we've gotten to do that together to give freely and joyfully for those who came into our midst, the pilgrims along the road, to feed them with open hands and to find joy in that task. So I told myself, never preach on Proverbs. And I don't know why I picked that today, especially because along with the challenging task of preaching to you on Proverbs, I also have to share some very difficult news with you in this time. And that is that after these many wonderful years, the time has come for me to end my ministry here at CCU. I've been offered an opportunity to serve as a pastor of a church in Portland, Oregon, one whose progressive mission and vision share much in common with ours here. It's a chance for me to build on all the things I've learned and done and experienced in your midst and as it allows me to continue my ministry while living in closer proximity to a supportive network of family, I've decided, after much prayerful deliberation, after much seeking of the wisdom of the Spirit, that the wise thing is for me to go. And as painful as it is to imagine saying goodbye to you, whom I've come to love so much as we've shared around the table these past years, I really have felt the spirit at work in this process beckoning me to something new and feel as though I must answer. Now I know this news for many of you is and will be difficult to receive. Trust me when I say it is even more difficult to deliver it to you. Some of us have walked a long way together And others of us are just getting to know each other. And in both of those, there is a sadness in the parting. I feel it, too, deeply. And I will miss you, too, so much, every last one of you. I will miss your questions and your curiosities. I will miss your joys and your concerns. I will miss your idiosyncrasies. And I think it's important that we take time to feel that together in the weeks ahead. I know there will also be a lot of worry. There always is when there is change. How will we go forward? Who will help us? What will we do? How will it be? And when the time comes for thinking on those things, I don't think it's quite yet. I think the time is for tending to our hearts right now. But the time comes, I want to assure you that the leadership of this church will be there for you, making sure that you are cared for and that this wonderful ministry will continue to thrive. There are so many kind and wise souls in the midst of this body, and I know they and you are up to the task. So there will be time for that. But in this moment, in this moment right here, I want to give you just a little bit of assurance. And that is this. As much as I share in your sadness, I want you to know that I also have great faith in you and in this community. I believe so profoundly in the ministry and mission of this church. And I believe so deeply in you, its people, your generosity and your conviction, and most particularly the hospitality that you offer the community of this island. I very much believe now more than ever before that the world needs, and more than that, it wants what you have to share about the love of God and how that love is all-encompassing. You know, we have done amazing things together, which is part of why it's sad and hard to imagine being apart. But I know, even though you may doubt it in this moment, I know that you can and will continue to grow the wise and open heart of this church in ways that delight God. I also believe profoundly that God will be present with you in this season, just as God has been present with me in this time of discernment. 
I believe that God's wisdom will be with you, offering itself to you along the way. I believe that God's surprising provision will lay out for you that which you need for your journey, each of you and you together as a body. I think that's what God has always done from the beginning and will always do. And so I would encourage you each in your individual worries and individual joys to just take a little bit of space to hear that voice calling. Take and eat. Come and dine. That's all you need do in order to be with me. So I share that news with you today, both in sadness but also in joy and in hope that the wisdom might continue to be embodied here as I have seen it done every day these last many years. We have a little while longer together, and I look forward to walking with you into the weeks ahead as we make sense of this. And I know wisdom will be there for both of us. So take heart, friends, on this journey. Take these words with grace, and I ask now that they might be blessed by the God who created, who redeemed, and who will always, always sustain us. Amen.